Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Dialogues. It's a pleasure uh, to have everybody today for the talk on the making of the Rutledge Companion to Northeast India by the editors, Professor Tanka B. Subba and Professor Yala J. P. Wooters. On behalf of IITGN Team Dialogues, I extend a warm welcome to the speakers. I would like to briefly introduce them now. Professor Subba retired as a professor from the Department of Anthropology, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, in April 2022. He served earlier as the second vice chancellor of Sikkim University. He has received awards like the Homi Baba Fellowship, Dr. Panchanan Mitra Lectureship, and R.P. Chanda Centenary Medal for 2015. That guest professorship at the Free University of Berlin and Baden Wittenberg Fellowship at the South Asian Institute, Heidelberg University. He was a member of the academic councils of Indira Gandhi National Tribal University and Jawaharlal Nehru University, and served as a member of the advisory boards of the National Museum of Mankind, Anthropological Survey of India, and the INTAC. He has authored and edited 16 books and published over 80 articles on various issues related to the Eastern Himalayas. He was the sectional editor for Northeast India and Bangladesh in Brill's Encyclopedia of the Religions of the Indigenous People of South Asia and co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to Northeast India. Professor Wooters is an associate professor in anthropology and sociology at Royal Thimpu College, Bhutan, as well as the chair of the Himalayan Center for Environmental Humanities. He holds an MPhil from the University of Oxford and PhD from the Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. Prior to joining RTC in 2015, he taught at Sikkim Central University, India, and was visiting faculty at Eberhard Karls University of Tübingen, Germany, under the Excellence Initiative of the German Research Foundation. He's the author of In the Shadows of Naga Insurgency, Nagas as a Society Against Voting, and other essays. Nagapolis, a community portrait, the co-author of Subaltern Studies 2.0, the editor of Vernacular Politics in Northeast India, and the co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Highland Asia and the Rutledge Companion to Northeast India. Um, the discussions for today's talks, to, to, today's talk is Professor uh, Madhumita Sengupta and Professor Ashish Khaha. Professor Sengupta is an assistant professor in humanities and social sciences at IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, she is a historian of modern India and works primarily in the areas of social history, colonial histories, and Northeast Indian histories. Professor Khaka is also an assistant professor in humanities and social sciences at IIT Gandhinagar and specializes in urban sociology. So uh, we will have this talk approximately for 50 minutes, and then we can open the floor for questions. Thank you. Over to you. So uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so let me begin by extending my hearty congratulations on this very you know, wonderful volume. And uh, thank you, uh, you know, uh, Professor Wooters and Professor Subba for agreeing to speak to us. And um, I'd like to say that this uh, volume, uh, what really makes it eminently readable, I think the first, and first point that I would like to mention is the size and length of the essays. Each of them are very short, succinct and eminently readable. And, um, uh, you know, uh, finally, uh, the, the value of the volume uh, comes from the fact that it puts before uh, the scholars of Northeast India studies all conceptual tools and theoretical frameworks um, available for comprehending the region, its people, its histories and politics. So once again, my hearty congratulations. So since you wanted me to, uh, you know, do this in the question answer mode, so I, ha I have a list of questions uh, with me today. Um, as I said, I managed to procure a copy of the volume and I managed to read several articles. So my questions would be primarily based on the articles that I've read. Um, uh, I hope you will excuse me if my questions do not extend to each and every article. But I do, I've, uh, you know, chosen a few articles um, based on, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, from the areas of politics, um, a methodology and uh, religion 
and then democracy, electoral politics. And I've made sure to read both your article uh, on animism and uh, Yella's article on uh, trade, uh, on the tribes and on uh, electoral democracy in Nagaland. Um, but the first question that I would like to ask you is how did you choose the topics for this volume? You know, they are wonderfully disparate, um, as diverse as the region itself. You had there are articles on trans Himalayan trade, on urbanization, animism, Brahmaputra, Hindutva futures, <clears throat> geomorphology, cultural citizenship, frontier feudalism, what have you. There's a mind boggling variety to the list of topics. And uh, there's something for each and every palette there. And quite symptomatic, as I said, of Northeast India itself with its um, uh, diversities. So how did you really choose? Did you have a seminar or conference where you brainstormed and arrived at this uh, list of topics? Or was it the vision of the editors alone which uh, really uh, made this possible? So how did you go about it? That would be my first question to you, Professor Subba. And, uh, to Professor yes, Maybe Yella could start. If I say something, if I have something to add, I'll add later. Um, thank you, um, uh, Marumita, and uh, the whole organizing team of the IAT Gandhinaga. I'm very happy to, to be here, and I'm also extremely happy to, to share the online platform with uh, Professor Tibi Suba, who was also my PhD uh, supervisor. Um, Regarding your, your first question, uh, we debated this for a while and eventually we decided to let the topics emerge organically in the sense that we approached scholars from and on the region, both Sydney and Julia, and we, tribes um, we requested them to um, propose the team that they are most familiar with and which they are who will be central to the Northeast India of, of the present and the future. So rather than us editors kind of dictating what we think is important, we really allowed the contributors to identify those topics they deem to be uh, particularly relevant. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Professor Subba, would you like to add uh, anything to it? No, no we, uh, to, be, to be really honest, uh, we did have uh, a mental list of uh, topics that uh, we thought were important uh, uh, if we were doing a book on Northeast India. You know, Northeast India is such a diverse, such a diverse kind of a uh, region that uh, the, to capture the diversity of the entire region is is a big challenge. But uh, we thought that at least some of those uh, topics must be there, if not uh, if not all. And of course, in most cases, as uh, uh, as Dr. Wouters said, uh, they, we allowed the uh, topics to emerge from the contributors themselves, rather than suggesting to them that he's right on this topic or that topic. So um, that's how the, there was more diversity of topics. We had 81, if you have seen the book, 81 uh, different uh, topics covered in the in the in the volume. That, that happened because uh, we, we allowed the contributors to come up with their own, own topics, own areas of specialization. Okay, so that's uh, okay. wonderful. Uh, let me uh, now get into the uh, questions based on my reading of some of the articles. So the first question uh, is a broad one. Uh, and it pertains to the labeling itself of Northeast India. It's a com companion, uh, Rutledge companion to Northeast India. So as you have many of the articles point out, and as you point out in the introduction yourself, that the region is not homogeneous um, enough to be tagged by a single uh, label. Yet I believe that there's a socio-cultural um, uh, logic to, to it. Otherwise, you would not have called it a companion to Northeast India. You know, after all, we do not have companions to North India or South India or uh, whatever. So however naive or arrogant the question might appear to you, I would request you to answer this for the sake of the audience here. Um, uh, do, uh, so are you considering Northeast India as a separate category despite its internal, many internal differentiations? Um, if so, how would you define it? 
The article by uh, Miriam Benner on ethno-regionalism sounds the correct caveat when it points to the chinks in the projected solidarity of the uh, region's people. And he points out correctly that this solidarity See. is evident when, it's, uh, when it comes to racial discrimination that people uh, face in Delhi or in Bangalore in some of these cities. Um, so uh, then, then again, when we look at the boundary issues also, we can see that there are too many conflicts that are happening within uh, the region. No, the 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 region the the Sorry, okay. And yet uh, there are overarching similarities in food, crafts, faith, occupation, and so on. So how do you see it? The, uh, my question to you would be, how do you see the matter of Northeast India being treated as a separate, um, single separate category? Could you shed, uh, shed some light on this? Yeah. Would you, would yeah. you like to start, Yala? Oh. Sorry. Um, I'm happy to follow you as well. And maybe pause. Should I repeat uh, the question? No. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you if you also kind of say who, who you expect to answer, <laughs> that might be easier for us to decide okay no i think i'll not do that <laughs> Rosa Suba. Okay. please uh, choose for yourself i mean i think both of you can respond i mean it doesn't have to be just no. one of you uh, otherwise we'll be keep doing this pele up pele up uh, <laughs> thing you know and, and... <laughs> okay maybe you can begin by uh, you know sort of responding and then we can uh, go uh, to the Buddhas. no um... Just two two points, and then let uh, uh, let uh, Dr. Wutas elaborate on it. I think we have we have not def defined the region as a bounded one. Uh, we have seen it as unbounded, open border kind of region where mm, not just people, but also mm, articles and uh, animals, birds, etc., also flowing in and out uh, continuously through history. And we we are we are kind of imagining this region as as this kind of uh, unbounded region and not really kind of uh, limited by the political boundaries of Northeast India today. That's why we have included the border border regions in some cases. Uh, we have included Tibet to a large extent. We've also included uh, Myanmar uh, to some extent, and all the uh, adjoining regions, Bhutan, Nepal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> And uh, we, we, we also believe that uh, not celebrating diversity doesn't really mean that you're undermining the unity of, uh, of a region. Uh, we, we are very much uh, aware that there are a lot of similarities across, uh, across cultures and across uh, tribes of this region and tribes and other communities of this region. Um, but at the same time, there are um, there are specifics, there are kind of dichotical marks uh, in 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 their uh, in their identities, which uh, which need to be uh, recognized and which need to be uh, which need to be uh, appreciated instead of kind of uh, broad painting, broad brushing them with one paint uh, saying saying that all tribal societies or all uh, plain societies or or things of that sort. So uh, we uh, we are trying to showcase the diversity of this region, but that doesn't mean that we undermine the unity uh, within the region. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that uh, that really helps. But uh, would Professor Wooters like to uh, also respond with his thoughts oh, on this um, point? I obviously uh, fully concur uh, with that. I might perhaps add that, of course, there is not a single region in India or anywhere that is internally homogeneous. So the fact that a region is diverse does not necessarily uh, characterize uh, Hello. the region. It's um, right in the channel. I'm hearing a lot of sound. I, I hope I'm audible. Um, there seems to be uh, just... Uh, just just con continue. continue. Yeah, you continue while we... may. Could you all please keep your uh, microphones muted, the audience, except for the speakers, of course. So perhaps let me also um, make two points. And the first one is in relation to, um, to um, the identity of the region. Um, 
the, ter the term Nordic Libya especially is, is somewhat um, ambiguous, as many scholars have pointed out, because it only makes sense as a relational term. It only makes sense after first asking northeast of what, right? And this would be northeast of, of Delhi, of uh, India's so-called mainland. But even that is not really fully correct, because there are plenty of, uh, there are various states and capitals, such as uh, Guwahati, Silong, or Aizol, or the whole of Tripura, which are in fact not even located northeast of, of most of India, or northeast of uh, Delhi. They're actually located southeast of, um, of Delhi. So this perhaps indicates the way the region is, is imagined. And perhaps it also explains why, as an identity, Northeast India is not really coined very often within the region itself. It only seems to acquire a certain kind of resonance by so-called Northeasterners when they are outside the region, not inside the region um, itself. Another challenge is uh, perhaps that the history of Northeast India is both very long and very short. Of course, as a political, legal, administrative entity, Northeast India undoubtedly uh, exists. Um, but at face value, it might seem that the region does not have uh, much of a history. Um, although some of the present day um, um, states like Assam, Manipur, Sikkim and Tripura, they have several centuries of recorded history uh, chronicled uh, often by, uh, by royal courts, such as in the Buranjis or in the Rajmara. Um, but technically, Northeast India was only born with partition in 1947. Uh, and that's to almost overnight. Most in the region did not really necessarily anticipate it, that they would become part of something that is called uh, Northeast India uh, today. So I think um, the question of what Northeast India is and what it is not uh, has quite a lot of dimensions that one could um, approach it from. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, I this um, so just one uh, thing that I would like like to add here is that you really uh, need not just respond to my questions. If you wish to uh, go in the talk mode and speak about the book itself, I think we can always do that, and my questions can be held, uh, you know, uh, for a later time. So, would you like to speak about the volume, both of you? And then I can come back with my questions later, perhaps. Maybe I would like to make yeah. um, make a, a particular point, if, if I may. Um, that is that for a very long time, Northeast India was seen kind of as a scholarly backwater, in which there is not really uh, a great deal of, of research happening. Uh, but this is no longer the case. Um, Northeast India has attracted um, uh, a large volume of, of very exciting scholarship, and not just in terms of empirical data or ethnography, but equally so in concept and, and theory making, and so really in its own right, and so in a wide array of, of disciplines and fields. And I think the companion shows that whether it is in geomorphology, archaeology, uh, in folklore, in citizenship studies, in identity and nationalism, notice Tinia is actually ahead of the theoretical curve. A lot of very innovative, groundbreaking scholarship is is taking place. And I think this is a change. I think earlier um, one could say that Northeast India was kind of applying concepts from elsewhere, testing theories which were not its own. But today, kind of uh, the region is really, I think, um, a theory making and concept producing uh, a region that is in many ways ahead of many scholarly curves. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problem was, or the challenge rather, is that this scholarship was, was very scattered and very dispersed. And even uh, scholars in and on Northeast India would not really know what was happening in fields related to their own. And I think one of our main objectives in putting this companion together was to bring scholars in interaction, not just with their readers, but also in interaction with one another, so that they are able to fertilize um, or cross-pollinate uh, different, different fields of, uh, of research. Mm -hmm. Okay, Professor Subba. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I if I take a little longer than uh, Dr. Waters, I hope you you don't mind. Uh, mm. Not at all. Uh, now, as, as someone uh, who's who was teaching at Northeastern Hill University for more than three decades, it was such a pleasant surprise for me to know that um, there are so many um, uh, scholars from the region and uh, on the region. 
I, I really didn't know that there were so many Indians working on the, on the region and also so many non-Indians, if I, if I use this category called non-Indians, uh, who have been working on this region. I was, I was so pleasantly surprised to, uh, that so many scholars, young and old, uh, have been working on, on this region. And uh, as far as the, in, the contributors are concerned, the older ones were basically from my list of uh, my list of uh, you know, people who, who I knew who had done some substantial work on this region, such as Asis's father. But um, the younger ones were mostly uh, from the list uh, of Dr. Wooders. And he, he often wrote to me saying that, uh, uh, shall we invite this person? And then I, I, I asked him, who's this person? I never heard of this person. And then uh, he, would, he would send it, um, uh, publications of that person. And, and publications are so, so impressive that uh, I, I never believed that the people with such good publications uh, are there. And I didn't know of them. It was, it was also that kind of uh, discovery, a huge discovery for me. And uh, um, of course, uh, uh, then we uh, we started, and then uh, when you started, and then, then the COVID happened, you know, the pandemic situation happened, of course, and most people would be willing to uh, kind of watch uh, films on Netflix rather than do this boring job uh, for us. But uh, we somehow persuaded uh, large many of them. Some of them had difficulties of going to libraries because libraries were closed those days. Mm -hmm. But some, somehow, um, somehow, uh, thanks to this internet facilities that we could manage as many as 81, uh, 81 entries. And uh, um, of course, uh, um, you wouldn't believe that we have, uh, um, we have people uh, contributing from as many as about uh, 19 di different uh, disciplines or subdisciplines. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, um, the, the largest group of uh, contributors uh, um, are working on intersections of various disciplines. You cannot really pin them down as historians or, or sociologists, et cetera. The, of course, the largest number being both of us anthropologists was from anthropology, but it was only marginally uh, kind of a larger number than the, than the group of uh, historians. It's, uh, anthropology, there were about 15 uh, anthropologists and there were about uh, 13 or 14 historians uh, contributing to this volume. And linguists, there were about nine, uh, uh, nine or ten linguists, and of course a huge number of um, uh, kind of people belonging to um, belonging to uh, kind of very interesting areas like uh, geomorphology, as uh, Dr. Wooters said, archaeology, ethnomusicology, and performing arts, uh, and uh, you name it. I, I mm. think um, some of these fields that that have been covered uh, in this volume are really exciting and are going to stay there for younger scholars uh, for, mm -hmm. for I, I think, for a decade or two at least. <laughs> and uh, these, uh, these 81 uh, contributions, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, are also uh, on almost on the, on the kind of... Uh, you should have the tab in front of you. Is it, is it really... Can you, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can. Right. Yes. Okay, I, I thought uh, I, I, was, I was gone completely. No. Now, you would have noticed that most of those uh, contributions are single worded or just uh, two, two words, or maybe three words at the most. Very rarely are there topics with uh, more than three, three words. But um, this, this is uh, because we have planned it in the, form, in the kind of style of an encyclopedia. And this is also the reason why we have arranged it in alphabetical order of mm -hmm. the of the topics, mm -hmm. and uh, we we also thought that it would be easier for easier for us readers to to look up for topics of their interest. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said before, this uh, companion is is a kind of a humble attempt to showcase the bewildering diversity of this region that we call North East India. I mean, there are problems of, of uh, calling this region uh, or naming this region or labeling this region. I have myself written on this, but uh, for the moment, uh, let's assume that there is such a region and then a, a region that we are trying to explore. 
Now, now, one little point that I would like to add is this, that um, this is also, this volume is also an audacious uh, attempt to make humans aware of the existence of other living beings and uh, other non-living beings as well. Very often, uh, we, we do not uh, uh, remember, we do not really pay attention to uh, livings other than humans, but uh, this volume kind of reminds uh, many, many, many of us about the existence and our interdependence with, uh, with rivers, forests, plants, animals, spirits, etc., etc. Now, in this uh, volume, we have some people, some contributors who are in the 90s, as well as I think some in some who have just crossed 19 hmm. uh, in terms of age. And uh, um, uh, this uh, doing this uh, companion was was uh, kind of editing this uh, com companion was was a huge huge kind of experience for us because we were we were dealing with about eighty different uh, scholars of different age groups, different genders, and different nationalities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And doing that it was was a huge challenge because uh, we we have our own cultural backgrounds working behind what do we say, how we say, how we uh, express ourselves, etc. And uh, at times, uh, at times we reach some kind of a tipping points as well. But I think um, we also learned a lot about uh, diplomacy, how how to deal with the difficult uh, people. And there were some difficult contributors. But um, I think they only taught us uh, how to how to how to be more diplomatic, how to handle things uh, more more mm -hmm. diplomatically. It wasn't uh, it was it wasn't a cake work as I as I would say. Sometimes we would we would be scolded. Sometimes we would be mm, kind of fired. Uh, but we kind of managed to carry along uh, people with more than a dozen disciplines. Uh, sometimes disciplines that we didn't understand very well. And, and yet uh, we try to understand those disciplines and uh, carry them uh, together and to, to produce this uh, highly, highly diverse kind of uh, um, uh, topics uh, in, in, in one single, single volume, which we think will be useful for young scholars and students for at least for a couple of decades more. Right. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. And you've done a splendid job. Of course, we not only have at a, at a, at a glance, the present of North East India studies, but also the futures of North East India studies. Yes. So that was a wonderfully, um, uh, you know, conceptualized uh, volume. So I'll just go back to uh, one of the articles that caught my attention. And this was um, uh, this was written by Swata Shiddha Sharkar. Um, this is on, on, on Himalayas as method. And um, I, when I read it, I uh, realized that he was not just talking about encouraging trans-border studies, which many of the articles are, of course, talking about. But uh, uh, he has a specific definition. And he says, which is very post-colonial, post and um, he says, Himal I quote him, Himalaya as a method is, however, neither about celebrating nor about denouncing the West. It is actually pursuing a quest to formulate a non-Western epistemic response towards the comprehens comprehension of a non-Western natural object, which otherwise has been grasped mainly through the methods of the West. Now, all that is fine, but I was wondering, Professor Subba, that many of the categories uh, uh, that we use when we talk about uh, refer to the people or refer to the northeast, they come from uh, the colonial rulers, right? And many of these like tribes have been internally accepted. So, um, uh, you know, opposing them could lead to another round of hostilities. So uh, what would be your thoughts on that? So we cannot no, but... com completely reject the, uh, the categories that, we've, uh, that the, the British have left us with. So that was my, uh, I was wondering how you would, uh, what would be your response to that? No, uh, I, I really I don't think uh, Sota Siddha was, uh, uh, was arguing uh, in favor of rejecting, yeah. rejecting the Western epistemology. No, I don't think he was doing that. What he was trying to uh, say is that the Himalayan epistemology uh, uh, is almost completely dominated by the Western epistemology, and it is time that we decolonize that 
and have some kind of uh, uh, emic or Himalayan uh, voice, you know, mm -hmm. or promote that kind of a voice uh, uh, once we have it. But uh, at the moment, we are, we are not even sure, but I think he is not even sure whether that kind of a voice is, uh, is retrievable, actually. He thinks that there, there, may, there may be such voices kind of hidden somewhere in the mountains, but uh, can we retrieve such voice and, and, and kind of more, uh, give more power to that voice so that some kind of uh, alternative epistemology emerges on the Himalayan region rather than going purely, going almost entirely by the Western epistemology. This is what I understood from uh, his uh, rather, uh, uh, his, his language is little uh, kind of, I'm not very comfortable with uh, with the kind of language that Sotasita writes or many young scholars write, but um, this is what I I understood. I may, if I'm wrong, Yalla, please correct me. <laughs> no, not, not at all. I think I would add to this that, um, uh, interrogating colonial categories is, of course, very important. And uh, the notion of tribe is uh, um, um, illustrates this very well, because the notion of tribe is an exogenous category. If you would go to most communities in Northeast India and you ask for a local vernacular, vernacular of the term tribe, it often doesn't exist. The closest they may come to is a, is a word that would translate simply as human or as men in a more kind of gender insensitive sense. At the same time, to discard those categories is also very problematic, especially when it comes to the notion of tribe. India took a very different route than let's say most parts of Africa. When the colonial masters kind of withdrew, um, the post-colonial states also challenged their categories. And in Africa, the notion of tribe became very kind of insulting and offensive and it is it was no longer, um, no anthropologist actually walking in Eastern Africa would freely use the word tribe because of the colonial overtones. But in India, of course, it became a legal category, making mm -hmm. it kind of impossible to uh, decolonize it. I mean, if you would decolonize it, you would perhaps um, not even think in the interest of communities who benefit from being recognized as a tribe. So um, I think even though colonial categories um, <clears throat> must be interrogated, uh, we have to do so also from the context of post-colonial realities. And I think that uh, Swata Sita is also doing that in the context, uh, not of tribe, but of uh, Himalayan studies. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll have to quickly run over the remaining questions and then it will be uh, at the turn of my um, uh, Ashish is turned to ask you some questions. So one of um, I have uh, one for you, uh, Professor Wouters, which is um, your um, article on um, you know democratic processes uh, in in places like uh, in states like Nagaland. But I'll come to that later. My uh, uh, the, the the question that I uh, would really like to ask has to do with the history, the history of the region, the history of migration and mobility, which um, uh, Professor Suba points out in the in uh, introduction, and many other authors uh, say shaped the uh, cultural demography the um, uh, of of the region. Now, one set of uh, migration is also happening outside, you know, from uh, the northeast to the rest of India, right? For education, uh, employment, and uh, uh, for, for, for various other reasons. And that's very closely aligned uh, with the electoral uh, success of the Bhartiya Janta Party in the region. And uh, the similarity that it political, at least politically speaking, at least that it imposes on this entire region and brings it closer to the um, uh, the so-called uh, Indian heartland. So the, my question is, at a time like this, when you constantly talk about the heterogeneity and uniqueness of the region, um, does it not connote another kind of closure, a different kind of closure? Does it not impose a different kind of closure um, and a deliberate denial of a different kind of impulse for change? Because clearly um, uh, in one of the articles, I don't recall which one, um, perhaps uh, Professor Suba in the introduction itself says that uh, there is a demand among the younger generation to be treated as equal uh, partners uh, in the rest of India. So uh, they're willingly going out 
and they're willing to be accepted. So that also means willingness to be accepted as part, part of the um, uh, union. So then at this point of time to talk of uh, uh, uniqueness would also then mean a denial of this uh, desire um, for change. So uh, what would be your opinion on this? Of course, that is um, a very charged uh, question, but I think there are a couple of uh, angles to it. Um, one angle would be that migration outside is actually emancipatory because they would uh, get opportunities, whether in terms of education and employment, and this especially applies to Northeastern youth, that uh, they may not necessarily get at home. But what is unique about migration, I think, from the region is that nearly all migrants return. They don't go to, they generally don't go to Mumbai, Delhi, or Chennai or anywhere to permanently settle. They go there to make certain achievements, to generate certain success, um, only to, to ever kind of um, uh, return and then ideally contribute to the communities back home, whether materially or in terms of ideas or in terms of exposure. Um, another, the conundrum that you, that you do seem to raise is um, in relation to the notion of indigeneity, the, the idea that communities in Northeast India are very intimate, um, intimately related to the soil. And if that is indeed the case, you could argue that voluntarily migrating away from it becomes problematic. But I think this is only seen as problematic in a kind of a scholarly kind of uh, uh, surrounding. I think for most uh, Northeasterners, especially youth, there is not really any contradiction here to feel very closely related to uh, their homes, their lands, the hills, the forest, and at the same time also be cosmopolitan in, in certain other fields uh, of, uh, of their existence. And I think it's quite wrong to see this as kind of mutually uh, exclu uh, exclusionary um, uh, in that sense. And in terms of asking for equality, this, this, of course, is legal equality, to be treated as equal citizens. Right? And to be treated as equal citizens does not mean assimilation in any which way. It simply means that you live under the same legal framework, under the same uh, kind of um, minimum kind of um, equality that, that the Constitution uh, affords. What they are asking for, basically, is only for the Constitution to be applied to them equally. That does not in any way mean that they are pursuing their own cultural erasure. So I think we can um, we can analyze this from, from quite a different um, uh, quite a, quite some different levels. And I'm sure Professor Super has uh, has much more to say about this. Okay. I, I really don't have much to say except uh, except uh, this small point that uh, uh, I think uh, the question Madhavita's question um, uh, had had one uh, one problem. The problem was that of uh, putting whole things in binary and either identity or assimilation kind of a thing. I think I think this uh, putting things in in uh, this kind of a binaries uh, is, is of course very much a part of the Western Western um, uh, theoretical um, uh, framework. Uh, I think that itself uh, needs to be needs to be uh, customized while applying uh, this theory to uh, to a region like North East India, where these things are not uh, not in black and white. But of course, I'm not just talking about this region. But since we are talking about this region, I'm referring to this. But even elsewhere, outside this region, I think uh, using binary uh, theoretical frameworks is not really going to be much helpful. There, there's not just things about black and white, but also a lot of gray in between. And uh, I think uh, when we apply theories to regions like North East India, uh, we need to be a little uh, sensitive about uh, not being uh, not being part of this kind of a binary theories. Um, mm -hmm. There is uh, just just to share this. Uh, the recently, the U.S. Educational Foundation of India had organized. Uh, uh, a talk uh, and in which uh, I was invited to speak why why people in North East India do not do not want to assimilate themselves what was the main main question that they wanted me to answer I said that who says that they do not want to be assimilated? they do not want to assimilate themselves 
Uh, and uh, I said, do, do you want them to be assimilated? Uh, have you ever said that you want them to be assimilated with the rest of India? Mm -hmm. And and the the counter question when when I asked, they had they really had no no answer. And uh, we haven't really um, made that kind of ecosystem, uh, created that kind of ecosystem where they feel that they are wanted or they they are they're part of they're part of this great country called India. And uh, I think without creating that kind of ecosystem to, to put the entire blame on the people saying that you are isolationist, you are identity conscious people, you, you, you do not adjust with the, with the societies outside, mm -hmm. uh, outside the region. This, I think this is not really a fair criticism of the people of this region. And I, I can be more, I can also be critical of the people of this region, but uh, on this occasion, I think, uh, I, I would like to defend their what they, what they are doing it by saying that um, I think the the responsibility lies equally on the rest of India to make them feel that they are part of this country. Thank you, Professor Subba. That really helps. Um, and um, quickly uh, speaking, just just one or two questions left from my side. One of which pertains to your own article. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, and since you speak about animism, is wondering. Um, this is a very, uh, uh, it, uh, it's a very delicate situation and uh, extremely volatile as well. Um, so, uh, what really is the risk? And there are there are um, you know uh, certain revivalist tendencies, Doni Poloi and various other faiths. Uh, they are they are emerging in reaction to these um, homogenizing drives, whether be it from Christianity or organized um, Hinduism. So uh, there is a definite threat to the various faiths, uh, indigenous faiths. So what? Uh, how big is this threat? You know, uh, what would uh, would you like to say something about this? How big is this threat? And um, uh, you know, uh, what are the people uh, doing? For instance, how are they resisting it? How are they adapting to it? How much is how much of adaptation is there? How much of resistance um, is there? And how big is the threat? Primarily, if you could comment on that. Okay. Apart, so that you know, if that Rick's uh, perception. Uh, factor uh, is perhaps a little bit of uh, kind of playing the role of uh, neutralizing what I, the sharp, the sharp ends of what I'm going to say, but, and in the main, uh, but nonetheless, let me, let me just tell you that um, um, academically, uh, and as well as administratively, there are huge problems of, uh, uh, problems of conceptually segregating uh, animism from Hinduism or, or vice versa. Now, if, if you read the introduction uh, to Census of India by H.S. Risley in 1931, he oh. writes at length on, on how difficult it is to, to make a separate category for animism. He just couldn't find enough justification for having a separate category for animism. So that's why those who are not Christians or Muslims, they, they are all Hindus. This is how the census operators were instructed to enumerate. Right. Now, <clears throat> This is happening. So all enemies are, are being counted or uh, the, they return as Hindus in the census census figures. Hardly, mm -hmm. uh, hardly uh, any any census takes care of animism as, as a religion. In fact, um, organized religions like Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, they don't recognize animism as as an uh, uh, as a religion. No. Forget about it's just about it's, it's a, Body of magical religious uh, beliefs and practices. This is how this is looked at usually. But um, I'm uh, trying to argue in this uh, in this uh, entry that animism is is a religion in 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 the sense any other religion is, and it has all the all the parameters of religion like Hinduism, Christianity, or Hindu or, or Islam. What it doesn't have is uh, written text. Or scriptures, but it has a huge uh, body of oral oral texts, mm -hmm. and those oral texts are, are of course uh, uh, are still being discovered. Mm -hmm. So, in lieu of written texts, it does it has oral texts. Besides that, it has everything. Everything, of course, the the priesthood, the 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 process of becoming a priest is different in, in animism. 
But it, it, this is also different from religion to religion. It's different from Hinduism to Christianity and Christianity to Islam. So every religion has its own ways of uh, identifying or selecting its priests. Hmm. Or, and, and how hierarchical the priest to, priest, priestdom is, is, also, is also reflected in animism. And animistic priests are also highly hierarchical. Some, they are, they are very clear divisions of work. As some can do only funerary rituals. Some can do only small birth, marriage rituals. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of um, hierarchy, hierarchies are there uh, in, in animistic religion as well. Mm -hmm. But because of various reasons, epistemic reasons again, uh, somehow people did not like to be associated with word animism for very long. It was seen as a rustic rustic uh, religion, a religion of the illiterate, etc., a religion of the oral societies. But now there is a, there is a huge uh, interest uh, and revival of interest, academic, theoretical uh, interest in animation. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons for this is that uh, people see some hope of, uh, of either rest of restricting or reviving our environmental degradation. Yeah. The way the, the way our environment is degrading or de being destroyed, uh, that is uh, there's some hope in animism for the, for either restraining it or re or kind of reviving it. So that's why a lot of scholars are into it uh, into animism. But the, uh, coming to uh, this uh, Donny Polo etc etc that that. that Rang Fraism, you see in an article with this, uh, because there uh, um, uh, she would know about it, Donny Polo and Rang Fraism. We yeah. have uh, uh, Rang Seng Kasi in, in, in among the Kasis, yeah. Song Sarik uh, among the Garus, etc. Right. Please, please remember that most of these names have come into being in, as, as, as response to as response to Hinduism or Christianity or Islam. Yeah. Response to to organize religions. These are not truly animistic religions. These are reform. These are reformist versions of animism. And in many cases, they have nothing to do with animism. They have moved so far away from animism to appear like organized religions like Hinduism that they have disconnected themselves usually from, from anim truly animistic uh, religions. I see. So when I say truly animistic religions, of course there are variations from Alaska to, to Africa, from Africa to Latin America and uh, Southeast Asia. There are huge variations in terms in, in the way animism uh, is, is practiced, even today. Hmm. And some do it uh, surreptitiously, some do it openly. That's a different thing. And in my own community, which was highly animistic, people have now started building temples. Hmm. Okay, temples now. Temples were never part of our religion, uh, animism. Uh, they've started uh, documenting the oral traditions or this uh, oral uh, oral um, practices. Now, once you document, then uh, you what you do is that then you fix it. You then the, it becomes very difficult uh, for anyone to change it. Hmm. Now, so, uh, whereas when it remains in oral form, it, it has that flexibility, it has that adaptability, and uh, um, it, it, it moves with the society, and also it's highly flexible in the sense that for the same uh, purpose, in order to placate a particular deity, a rich person may sacrifice a, a mithun or a cow, whereas a poor person may offer simply an egg if he, if he can afford that. Or if he doesn't have even an egg, they can just give a small piece of ginger. Even that will do. So that kind of a flexibility uh, is, is there in animism, which, uh, which is getting challenged, which is getting uh, threatened because of mimicking the organized relations. Right. By, these, right. In, by the people uh, who, are called, who are called enemies today. Mm -hmm. So threat is not just from the uh, from the a uh, ruling dispensation which is trying to appropriate all these religions, including Christianity and Islam. They're saying that they were all born Hindus kind of thing, right? So uh, they, they were only Hindus in India and they are only Hindus today because mm -hmm. these are, these have just moved away from Hinduism for the time being, uh, and but their blood, their roots are in Hindu. 
So that kind of appropriation is is not limited only to organized religions, but mainly, uh, but is also extend also extends to animism. Hmm. Yeah, don't you follow itself uh, as yeah. a council now? So there's a threat from uh, that evolved, as well as there's a threat from below. Right. The people themselves are also moving towards that kind of organized religions, which is not in their fiber, which is not in their genes actually. Right. Thank you, uh, Professor Subba. That uh, was really helpful. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, one last question uh, from my end to Yale, which is um, about uh, the intertribe debates that he talks about in his article on electoral uh, democracy um, and uh, electoral practices in Nagaland. Um, uh, he uh, talks about intra-tribe debates and discussions, which is very enlightening. Um, I just wanted to know how uh, you propose to make this a part of contemporary electoral practices. Um, what is the way forward? And is there a solution there that you are suggesting to the so-called insurgency issue? And this question is uh, to Professor Wouters. Um, I'm not sure whether I fully understand your question. Um... So you you were talking about intra-tribe debates and the uh, history of debates and discussions within the tribe and how uh, they used to function the uh, the concept of um, equality and the freedom to speak out uh, in tribal councils. Inter -tribe. So then uh, then you talk about electoral politics uh, as well. So I was wondering if there is a solution. You're trying to make it somehow proposing that this should be, uh, you know, incorporated into our modern electoral practices some, somewhere or the other. And uh, through it, a solution perhaps could be found uh, to the to various issues, including the issue of insurgency. I'm not sure I understood uh, um, you uh, please excuse me there, but I was just wondering if that is there. Right, um, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the entry is, is not on Nagaland uh, specifically, it's on uh, Northeast India uh, as a whole. So what I um, try to do is to illustrate three narratives that uh, I would argue exist simultaneously. The mm. first narrative is that of uh, political refusal in which a number of communities uh, refused initially okay. to participate in uh, elections for what it would communicate. And voting would communicate the acceptance of the Indian constitution. And the Naga at first, uh, but also several communities later, they um, abstained from participating as an act of political refusal. Now, till today, there are plenty of election boycotts. There is not a single election, I think, in the region that is not boycotted somewhere or the other. But the reason for these boycotts today is no longer kind of blatant political refusal, but rather it has become uh, a tool uh, or a medium that communities use to draw attention to certain miscarriages of justice or certain promises that did not materialize or uh, development that did not arrive. And by boycotting an election, you are in a way stabbing at the very heart of, of the state, which is the democratic process. Mm -hmm. So political refusal continues to take place, but for very different purposes if you compare it to the 50s and 60s and you compare it to the, the contemporary historical moment. So resistance is one narrative of democracy in elections in, uh, in Northeast India. The second narrative would be that of the coexistence between the democracy process and escalating violence. Sometimes this violence is organized by the state. If you think about the Armed Forces Special Power Act, it's hard to imagine an act like that to coexist with, uh, with a functioning democracy. But also, of course, the mutual kind of implications between state and non-state actors in the democracy process. So violence comes from many sources and uh, uh, circulates uh, and navigates and finds its way through uh, society, especially perhaps at, um, in electoral seasons. But the third narrative, I think, is the most illuminating one, and that is the one you are, I think, referring to. And this is the idea of vernacular democracy, the way in which uh, many communities in Northeast India kind of refused to adjust their culture and traditions to democracy, uh, to democratic ideals, but made democratic ideals adjust to local traditions and local cultures. Yeah. One of those is the idea of consensus candidates, of public deliberation, of 
kind of defying the idea of individual and autonomous reasoning by the idea of community consensus, in which uh, an entire community, be it a village, be it a clan, be it a, be it a tribe or any other community, votes as one. That does not mean that there are no internal disagreements, but the idea would be that those disagreements have been settled in one way or another prior to polling day, so that a particular social unit votes as one. And here the idea of community unity, even if somewhat artificial, is privileged over the idea of the individual kind of uh, individual kind of autonomy um, to, to express oneself. Um, I do not necessarily make the suggestion that this is the way forward, but I do think that, um, that we should be open to the idea of thinking about democracy not in a kind of vacuum, but in a kind of cultural context. And that democracy in one part of the world, or even in one part of India, does not necessarily have to be have to mean uh, or be performed in exactly the same way in another area that may have a very different set of traditions or history or, or culture. So what I think I'm arguing for is to kind of open up the idea of what democracy is and what it is not, and to make it a bit more culturally um, um, flexible, so to speak. Thank you so much. So it's Ashish now. Thank you, Mother Mehta, for um, in initiating that discussion. So I'll um, I'll just begin with the disclaimer that I've not had the pleasure of uh, of reading the volume so far. I'll I've we've just ordered a copy for our lib for our library, and but based on the on the contents that I saw that are present in in the book, um, I just wanted to start with this um, sort of discussion that. Tribal studies in India, in and, in and of itself, is a very complex subject matter. It's been debated with, uh, especially if it's juxtaposed vis-a-vis -vis caste studies, because the whole population demographic, cultural politics and all that. Um, and even in terms of ge geographic uh, mixture, there has, um, if we begin from the, or from the colonial constructs of of excluded versus partially excluded areas all all the way till um sorry fine so um are you am i audible to you? yes yeah. yes so, uh, um yeah so uh, and then going going uh, to the post 47 period of the of the fifth and the sixth schedule areas and all the way to northeast as a geographical social imaginary and con construct so the uh, range of of academic discourse that has been uh, sort of covered in the last 75 odd, odd years has focused more on the macro issues but i think what the volume is trying to offer is a more um, ground grounded and more uh, heterogeneous view of the region itself because it is not uh, from what I can see, it is not really making a, a common overarching ar argument. It is uh, it is allowing for uh, people from different communities to speak up. So my question is that uh, was that uh, an editorial choice to sort of allow a perspective from within, a very heterogeneous perspective from within to emerge, or did it just come out as a um, you know, as um, as the churning was taking place when the when when the meetings were were going on as to who would uh, how would the volume actually take shape. So, what was the thought? I mean, just as an adding up to what Madhumat said, that how was this thought process really taken into account? So, that would be my first question. Mm. For whom? For, for whom? Oh, maybe you can start and then maybe okay. Yale can. Okay. Mm. Um. When we started, of course, uh, we had some idea of uh, once the word companion was was kind of accepted by us, uh, uh, we consulted some some companions. So there are some very good companions uh, uh, in the in, in the uh, published uh, uh, literature. So um, we had some idea about uh, what the companions should look like. Uh, but uh, we we made it of uh, kind of a little conditional uh, on part of all contributors that none of them shall uh, write only on one community of this region, nor on one particular um, uh, state. 
So whatever they write on, uh, so thematically, at least, uh, if not uh, on the basis of ethnographic data, should cover more than one state, uh, several states if possible, and several communities if possible. But we discourage anyone uh, to write on a single community um, or single state. So that was uh, not with the idea of uh, kind of uh, showing uh, similarities or, uh, or showing the breaches rather than showing the differences. But we thought that uh, if we go to the level of communities, then uh, it would be beyond uh, beyond uh, manage beyond manage any manageable uh, kind of situation. Uh, you know, uh, the ethnic diversity, the the tribal diversity is such so much in in the region that we would need several such companions to to take care of uh, every every one of those uh, tribes and communities. And the problem is if we if we if we include Ao, then don't include Lotha, then we had it. So you know, to to we will not be able to answer why 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 Lotha and why not Ao, or, or why Khasi and not not Garo. That kind of questions would would would, would arise. So we we kind of played uh, safe by saying that okay we do not encourage any any uh, entry or any chapter uh, specifically on one tribe or one community or one restate etc so even uh, by putting that kind of condition the diversity that emerged uh, uh, which is mostly because of the author's own fields of uh, specialization uh, is huge already Okay, and uh, um, so um, this only shows uh, how diverse uh, uh, the region is. That even when we try to we try to uh, put in some kind of condition to bring in more more kind of a similarity or play down the very very uh, micro level of diversities, we try to kind of discourage that. And still, the diversity that has emerged is huge. So we, our role uh, to this uh, role was uh, to the extent that we tried to discourage this kind of a micro level diversity uh, 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 in our in our uh, chapters. Thank you, um, Yale. Would you like to add to that? Perhaps a very small point, and that is that we um, expected all contributors to provide some kind of evaluation or survey of the existing literature in relation to that topic from across the region. So any particular contributor might have a regional um, specialization, let's say on Assam, but if um, a particular topic would also have relevance for Mizoram or Chikura or any other part of the region, we would expect um, the contributor to make a reference to that uh, literature. So in that way, by asking this naturally, um, any team would transcend the specifics of place and would uh, speak to the region at large. Okay, um, thank you for the very wonderfully um, um, clear answers. Um, the, the second question comes from uh, the point which Professor Suba had made, the whole idea of how census in a way categorizes Pe um, people and the way um, Risley's whole, uh, even Risley's, in a way, um, in inhibition to say that animism cannot be classified as a religion, say per se. But if we look at the environmental and and global context today, in the in the context of um, uh, global warming and climate change, we also see a sort of. Uh, pedagogical shift towards an animism, not the animism as it was practiced before, but a more reformed form of an animism. But uh, so do you feel that, and, and this question is again open for to, to both of you, do you feel that there's also a sort of uh, global north pressure in terms of how are certain religious practices uh, sort of looked at, viewed, and in a way fa favored vis-a-vis -vis the larger um, uh, global structures rather than looking at the epistemic changes that are taking place in the society it's, it itself vis-a-vis -vis maybe something like integration versus assimilation. So where does it actually, where does this um, census religion uh, and um, particularly in the context of animism, where, where do you think that this debate actually lies? 
to to be very to be very brief um, the census uh, census is what it is it it cannot provide um, kind of multiple categories for the same uh, same person i cannot be both I, I cannot be both hindu and buddhist whereas in in reality i may be practicing both these religions i may go to a monastery for certain uh, prayers and i may also go to a hindu temple or on the same day i may visit uh, both the uh, both a monastery and a hindu temple my if you really visit uh, these himalayan regions you'll see that many houses on the walls you'll see the the, the pictures of more than one religion hang, uh, hanging on the wall uh, and many places even in the altars you'll find the photographs of jesus as well as uh, saraswati and uh, um, and mahadev uh, um, um, or uh, also uh, Gautam but uh, or Dalai Lama also you'll find multiple uh, I religious uh, uh, icons uh, put in the same altar and they 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 burn incense and and say their prayers to, before all all these uh, all these uh, religious uh, heads or religious uh, uh, representatives so this kind of syncretic religion is 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 not reflected in our census enumerations census you ask whether you're hindu but this question you cannot be no, you cannot be um, a follower of more than one religion whereas in reality in the, particularly in the himalayan regions i know in the tribal regions i know people follow more than one religion in fact uh, um, this is not just true of india but also some of these uh, himalayan countries like uh, bhutan and nepal so uh, this is uh, as far as the as far as the uh, census is concerned but as far as the environmental kind of aspect uh, of uh, animism is concerned by the way i'm not claiming that animism is the only religion that uh, that deal that kind of uh, takes care of uh, questions relating to hindu to environment i'm i'm part of one interfaith uh, i moderate i've been moderating interfaith dialogues uh, um, for uh, two three three institutions of this uh, district two of this region and one from outside india for for the last 3 years and i've noticed uh, i've noticed through the presentations of various uh, dialogues that there there's a huge uh, uh, contribution a uh, huge dis discussion a huge amount of information uh, about environment in buddhism in in islam in christianity uh, and also in hinduism so um, in fact uh, uh, this is also this is also a field that that uh, religious experts in in different religions they are also looking at and there are written written texts where they can uh, where they can where there are references to environmental sustainable environmental um, uh, um, uh, living and respect for forests respect for rivers uh, worship of rivers uh, uh, etc or, or animals plants both etc all that is reflected in many of the uh, uh, sacred uh, religious texts of hinduism buddhism at least hinduism and buddhism i know very much but recently i came to know that this is also true of islam and christianity so uh, in animism doesn't have that monopoly of of doing something uh, or kind of salvaging the world uh, uh, from the environmental crisis but um, i think if uh, if it is uh, kind of uh, showing the way and other organized religions are following the path, following that way i think uh, the world has a brighter future thank you very much um yale would you like to add something to that maybe um quite very briefly i think in understanding animism in the region one could think of old animism and new animism and what changed between old and new is not animism itself but it is the perception of what animism stands for so if you look at the colonial kind of monographs animism is somewhat ridiculed it's kind of assumed that as societies progress as they develop animism will eventually fade away um this has not really really happened but i think today um amid climate change to go back to ashish's first point and and capitalism animism is starting to inspire a new kind of world view a new kind of relational imagination that offers a very profound critique to um to anthropogenic uh, climate change modernization and 
and kind of mindless uh, development. And this animism is also what is inspiring um, uh, more than human perspectives and multi-species studies. And I bring this up particularly because we also have an entry on, on multi-species studies um, in the companion, which in a way is very much inspired by, uh, by the animistic imagination, um, if you will. And um, <clears throat> to think of humans not as um, uh, in, uh, in as exceptional, but very much as entangled with, with plants, with spirits, with mountains, uh, and with animals, does foster or nourish a kind of imagination that is inherently more critical of, of capitalism and, and, um, and modernity um, in that sense. And Professor Suba and I, we have really tried, uh, although we have a particular chapter on animism, we have really tried to open up the companion to more than human voices. I do not know to what extent we have uh, succeeded, but we, we have tried to be less human centric in our understanding of, of Northeast India. Okay, thank you so much. Um... Yeah. Yeah, so uh, on that note, I think on, on the note of uh, having more and of, a, of an epistemic dialogue with this subject. So I'll, I would like to open this discussion to the audience. So if both the real audience here and the virtual, I think we can begin with the real audience, with the real audience over here. So if they have any questions, they please feel free to ask. Am I audible? Yes. So, uh... Yeah, so uh, actually, I, I just got the chance to only read the introduction part of the book. Uh, so one uh, sentence that struck with me that I want to quote that okay. in uh, seeing this reason, reason hence much de uh, depends on who is doing the seeing. Uh, uh, so quoting that particular sentence, I want to actually no uh, pers a certain kind of uh, perspective in, in the context of positionality when so many people from the reason and within the reason there is again an insider outsider uh, positionality as a researcher and again uh, who is from outside the reason so uh, that the dilemma of positionality how to look at it in terms of uh, studying uh, northeastern in, in northeastern region, and at the same time, since in uh, in the introduction also uh, there Ali. is kind of like a problematics of decolonization also been mentioned. How we look when we look at the decolonization from the larger Indian context. Uh, uh, so, uh, is decolonial method a uh, alternative or? Uh, should there be a, another methodological alternative while looking at this reason? Thank you. Yalla, start. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's a, an excellent question. Um, I think what uh, what we argue is that uh, Northeast India is never just one place. There is always many places at once. And when we see that uh, the perspective of the region depends on who's doing the seeing, we can think of different representations that exist about the region at the same time. So if you are, if you belong to the military, you might look at the region as um, the geopolitical, sensitive and insurgency ridden borderland, as a place to be protected. If you look at the region as a tourist, you might see it as an exotic destination to be gazed at. If you see it as a revolutionary, you might see it as an occupied land that must be set free. If you see it as an administrator or a developmental expert, you might see it as a remote and backward zone that needs to be developed. If you are a capitalist, you might see it as an untapped resource frontier that must be accessed and exploited. And if you are a scholar, you might see it as, a, as an ethno-linguistic laboratory that, that must really be understood. And if you are an indigenous inhabitant, you see it as the center of the world. I think this is what, what we really mean by saying that no, the way Northeast India figures is, is really related to uh, who's doing the seeing and from where uh, this seeing takes place. Now, your second question, of course, is a, is a very complex one, but also a very important one. Um, there is a lot of talk about decolonizing uh, disciplines about decolonizing theories and about decolonizing methods. And my position here is that there is not a single way of doing so. And that this is a very difficult uh, but important 
spot to be traversed, but that a very solid beginning is to start working through local categories, through local concepts, right? And in anthropology and other disciplines, we might call this grounded theory, in which we theorize really from the people's perspective up, rather than coming into the region with uh, a backpack full of theories and concepts from, from elsewhere. Okay. Um, maybe Who's next? Nishant has a Nishant question. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you very much for the uh, talk. I, I'm uh, Nishant. By the way. Uh, so, yeah, I think we talked uh, a little bit about the cultural and political aspects. I, I'm just curious, you know, just from my own interest about. Um, you know, the, what kind of, because you included a few chapters on language in there. So how do you thought that uh, language sort of worked within the politics of Northeast India? I saw Tanmoy was there also, I think he contributed, right, as well. I don't know if he's still there, but but yeah, but maybe if, if some of the contributors are there, they can also, but as editors, um, because I think there's some different language politics is a little bit different in Northeast India, in, in many of the regions, um, I mean, uh, except for maybe Assam where it was, uh, you know, historical, but in, in some of the other areas uh, that uh, language has played out very differently in, in different places. And there's also this questions of script and how important language is to, particular kinds of identities or how not important it is, for instance. I mean, I don't know, like some, that that could also be a question, I think. So, um, and, you know, as we see most of the lang most of the areas have not adopted official language as, you know, any, any particular language except for a few. So, yeah, so I'm just wondering how you think that played in and what, what kind of insights were got from, uh, uh, from, uh, from those chapters and how they, how you also viewed it in the larger project. Uh, should I take this question? Please, yeah. please. All right. Uh, language politics is, is, is very interesting in Northeast region. In fact, uh, you know, one of, the re one of the most important reasons why one single state of Assam became five states of Northeast India is the kind of... Uh, uh, the language of, uh, hegemony of the Assamese. And uh, Assam itself, uh, the, the Assam, which was then consisted of the entire Northeast India, minus Manipur and Tripura, those two princely states, came out of the Bengal province again on language issue. Okay, when Bengali language was imposed on the, on the, on the entire Assam, the Assamese revolted and then uh, mm, they thought that their, their culture, their language would be would disappear in, in a period of maybe three, four decades. So uh, they, they demanded to be separated from Bengal province. And then uh, they, but what, they, what they fought against in the case of Bengali uh, hegemony of language, they, they perpetrated the same thing on the hill tribes. And as a result, those four um, states came out of uh, came out of some. And uh, um, this, uh, there's also huge uh, politics relating to recognition or scheduling of languages under the eighth schedule. Uh, because as you know, um, there are very few languages from this region. Uh, this language, this region is very rich in diversity of languages, but very few of them are recognized as, uh, uh, as uh, national, langu national languages. From the border community, the, uh, from the tribal communities, we have more than 200 tribal communities, but only one tribal language is recognized in the eighth schedule. So we have these uh, we have these issues, and then we had requested one of my uh, very competent uh, friend friends, a linguist, and also working on language policy and language politics, who himself had worked in Nagaland for a pretty long period of time, but due to um, COVID deaths in and around his family. Uh, he could not make it finally, and uh, uh, he uh, we we gave him extensions, uh, two extensions, and still he couldn't make it. 
So we don't have any entry or any chapter on language politics or language policies and implication of language policy under new education policy for Northeast region. Uh, we wanted to have that all as well, but finally we have ended up um, having uh, entries which are highly uh, technical, purely academic, like uh, syntax on language acquisition, language transition, uh, or, or things of that sort, um, and on Tibetan Burman languages, on uh, on Himalayan uh, upland languages, their characteristics, etc., or changes in those languages. So the entries that we have got, about eight of them, but they are all purely academic. I'm not saying that academics is free from politics, but uh, they do not deal with the politics of language per se. But there is, in any, any academic society, there would be some, some political play at the background, but that's not uh, something that, that, uh, that we, could, we can avoid. We, we all do a little bit of uh, small politics here and there, in academics as well, but the uh, otherwise on uh, on the face value, it's all all the eight of them are purely academic uh, uh, entries. We somehow could we tried our best, but we couldn't manage uh, any uh, anyone to write on the politics of language in North East India, which would be very very interesting. I was myself very interested in that, but we couldn't manage it. That's one of our limitations. Thank you, Professor Subha. I think we have uh, now we can take questions from the online audience. I think um, Subha Rao has a question. So, Subha Rao, if, if you can please un unmute and ask a question. It must be very early morning for him. Sir. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Hello, everybody. I'm in California. Hmm. So, okay. good morning. Um, San Francisco. Okay. I'm very happy that I could get up and catch up with the meeting. And Professor Subha, you made a very good point. There is diversity, but at the same time, there is unity. This is what I see from a linguistic perspective also. Yes, the Tibeto-Burman languages are entirely different in one way, in quotes, entirely different, that they look unique or different. But at the same time, there are certain linguistic features that all the languages of the subcontinent share because of having been together for centuries. Number one, also, we should not forget that all the tibeto burman languages are verb final. The verb comes at the end, unlike English or French or many of the European languages. So, like, so we share lots of features with Japanese and Korean because the verb comes at the end. So this kind of unity is there in languages, for example, reduplication, echo words, or question, tag questions, isn't it? He's coming, isn't it? We are going, isn't it? This kind of questions, I think, whether you are from the Northeast or whether you are from the South or whether you are from uh, Indo-Aryan belt, of the belt. Uh, so you can see the similarities so this point that you made, that there is diversity while there is underlying unity. I like that expression. And uh, another part of this I want to say is the linguistic convergence. Yes, there, there could be cultural convergence eventually, maybe 50 years from now or 100 years from now, or maybe not. There would be cultural convergence between the so-called Tibetan tribes and the major, we are also tribes, you know, Dravidians, indo we are all tribes basically. Okay, so the major tribes versus the minor tribes. And we have to have lots of give and take. The linguistic convergence is an indicator that by interaction, yes, there could be a lot of convergence. What is the best example you have? Nagamese. Nagamese is a language that evolved because of the interaction of the Nagas with the Assamese people. So this kind of involvement of new styles of language, or if you take a, a language like Ao, or any of the three, Mongsen, or um, all these, okay. These are, uh, sorry, I'm making everybody waking, waking up. <laughs> I'm talking too loud. So I'm talking a bit low. So 
what happens is uh, the kind of uh, convergence that Nagamis, uh, the, sorry, the Awo languages have, or some of the Naga languages have, with other parts of Indo-Aryan or Indo-Aryan basically languages, is very interesting. And this is the right direction for languages to emerge. They may or they may not, but that will be wonderful to see a lot of linguistic convergence as well as cultural convergence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baro. And this is what I tried to bring in my paper. Hmm. Is there any other question from the uh, Zoom audience? I don't think so. So maybe we should. Uh... Uh, Tanmoy is there on the Zoom. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Tanmoy? Yes. Tanmoy. Yes. Yeah. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I lost uh, connection in the department, uh, and I had to rush home. Um, so I missed the last point that uh, Subha was talking about. I think he was talking about the linguistic uh, linguistics uh, uh, contributions, and that regretting that there was. Uh, nothing on the uh, <clears throat> language and Polymer. power uh, connection. That's the part I caught, but I sort of missed it in between because I had to drive home and get connected. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I just wanted to say that uh, I haven't, uh, of course, had access to the other entries, but um, as far as uh, I have two entries on language and culture and language and migration. migration. Yeah, so in the migration chapter, I, as you would remember, you had to sort of edit out certain things because um, <clears throat> uh, for uh, reasons best known to uh, editorial decisions, but there were certain uh, passages uh, looking at the inter, uh, uh, you know, inter Northeast, in, uh, Northeast India migrations. And I was looking at the census figures, uh, census figures, uh, uh, whatever they are, uh, uh, there is some truth that you can discover. Um, from the census figures, I always believed. And we looked at this, I looked at this uh, figures of migrations away and into Assam and discover certain very interesting patterns, which is sort of, a, you know, as like kind of a, um, a material for actually a, a paper. But I think there is also a lot of uh, um, politics of language uh, within the Northeast. For example, I mentioned about uh, Khasi is still not being recognized as a scheduled language. And here I have, you know, my Panar student, Imontre here, and, uh, uh, you know, it's like um, too far in the future that uh, Panar will be um, recognized as uh, a language. So that is very much an indication of uh, politics of language within the Northeast. And uh, uh, there is, of course, the politics of language uh, from outside the Northeast onto the Northeast, and that is a topic uh, by itself. But I just wanted to mention that, as you said very correctly, that within our academic quote unquote activism, we try to um, uh, leave uh, various implications uh, for future generations to uh, perhaps discover if uh, that would be possible. And there, I think the politics uh, kind of shows because I think. I could see the politics, uh, which is very different from me, uh, my politics, uh, in uh, writing of other uh, linguists, not necessarily in the scientific theoretical papers, but at least in these kind of papers, which are encyclopedia, encyclopedic entries, where you talk more generally about, uh, uh, as part of your editorial decision, generally about the Northeast as a whole. I think that's uh, very much there. And as you said earlier, when I was listening to you in this meeting, that um, you know what kind of uh, um, what kind of situations we will be even in this kind of uh, meetings, we don't know. So we have to uh, always strike a balance between what we can through our academic uh, disciplines say or not say. But I think it it needs to be really discovered by the reader themselves to see the implications of the power of language that is a thing hidden or politics of language that is hidden in some of these entries. Thank you. 